The text for today's meditation comes to us from Paul's first letter to his young understudy Timothy, the fifth chapter, reading from verse 21, and reads as follows. Now, this is out of the King James Version. Paul says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing out of partiality. Thus far the text. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our risen and ascended Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear Christian friends, I should say, before I even start preaching today, that I've actually been working on this sermon for about two weeks, maybe even a little longer than two weeks. You might recall 168 hours ago, seven days, we were in this very same house of God. I was in this very same pulpit. You were in your very same pews sitting here in the house of God to worship, to praise, to thank, to adore our great Lord and Redeemer, Jesus Christ. And we talked about what? The end of the world. Well, looks like we all made it, didn't we? And yet we dare not lower our guard. I would encourage you again, you know, in your afternoon devotions today, your evening devotions before you go to bed at night, read Mark chapter 13, verse 33. Mark chapter 13, verse 33. Heed and heed well the words of Jesus Christ. Be alert. Keep watch. You do not know when the day or the hour will come. You know, I thought about that a lot as I was watching the news yesterday and on Friday, you know, Hurricane Harvey churning its way through the Gulf of Mexico, making its way toward the great state of Texas. And I thought, you know what? The amazing thing about this hurricane hundreds of years ago, even 100 years ago, you didn't know a hurricane was coming until it arrived, correct? My great-grandfather, he was a captain captain of a ship and what he used to do, the way he made his living, he would sail. These were in the days of sailing ships. He had a three-masted schooner and he would sail between Tampa and Texas. And what he would do is he would take lumber over to Texas and he would bring cattle back to Florida from Texas. He lost two ships in a hurricane. One was run aground. He tried to run before the storm, drove it up onto a sandbar. It got stuck there. The waves were beating the ship to pieces and literally like the Apostle Paul, the way he and his crew escaped escape to safety was to take boards and barrels and hold on to them, jump over the side of the ship, and swim to shore. They had no idea that storm was coming. For the plain and simple reason, the communication that we have today was beyond their imagination in their day. But today, we knew exactly, we knew precisely when that storm would hit, where it would hit, what power it had, what damage it could cause. And so people were able to prepare. I mean, what do we do? We go to the store, we buy boards, we buy plywood, we board up our home, we tape our windows, we buy water, we buy canned goods, or we just get out of town. But of that day and hour, says Jesus Christ, knoweth no man. Therefore, be prepared. Be alert. Be on watch. Always be ready to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I think that ties in really well to what I want to talk about today because we're in 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're working our way through Paul's first letter to his young understudy Timothy. And we did chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. And notice, notice the progression of steps. Notice the outline that the Apostle Paul uses. The very first thing he does is give a word of encouragement to his young pastor friend. This guy is brand new in the ministry. He is experiencing problems and difficulties that happen in every church and every congregation regardless of denominational loyalty you know there are problems in the church 
Peter says, or Paul says, be strong. Hang on, be faithful. Be faithful to the word. Be faithful to your people. Be faithful to your calling before God. Because sometimes when you preach, people don't want to hear what you're saying, right? Kind of stings a little bit. I remember one pastor telling me one time, you know what the definition of a great sermon is? He told me, he said, the definition of a great sermon is when the message flies right over your head and lands in your neighbor's lap. <laughs> yeah, sometimes a sermon can be a little painful to hear. Reminds me of an old story I heard a long, long time ago about this one particular parishioner. He would come to church every Sunday, and after the church service, the preacher, he would preach his sermon. They would have the worship service. They would sing the hymns. They would pray the prayers. And this one particular guy, he would go out of the church every single Sunday. He would shake the pastor's hand, and he would say, Pastor, that was a great sermon. You really told them. That happened Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and the pastor, he, he would get down on his knees every Sunday night, Lord, show me a way where I can reach out to this man, where I can communicate to him that I am talking to him, to his spiritual life. And one night he got down and he prayed with all his heart and soul and spirit, and that night a tremendous snowstorm covered the entire region. And early that next morning, the pastor went to church, and not a single person showed up. Every single parishioner stayed home except for that one man, that one individual. And he sat right on the front pew, right in front of the pulpit, and the pastor said, praise God, you've given me a great opportunity. God, I'm going to talk to this man, and he'll know that there's no way I'm talking to anybody else. And he got in the pulpit, and he held forth strongly with the Word of God, looking directly at that individual. And when the service and the sermon were done, the pastor went to the back door, and the parishioner came out and shook his hand, and he said, Pastor, that was a great sermon. That was a powerful sermon. You really told them. It's just too bad they weren't here to hear it. <laughs> Sometimes it's like that. Paul encourages Timothy, stay faithful to the Word of God. Stay faithful to your calling as God's minister. And Paul goes on to say, he says, you know, this is how you remain faithful. This is how you remain strong. You immerse yourself in the Word of God day and night, 24 hours a day. You read, you mark, you learn, you inwardly digest. And that is how you maintain sound doctrine, which is of vital importance within the church. And then Paul warns Timothy, beware of false preachers. They're going to come, they're going to twist the Word of God, they're going to manipulate the Word of God, they're going to pick and cherry pick, pick and choose the verses that they want. They're going to discard and throw away the verses that pang their conscience and people will listen to them and be drawn astray. Beware of them, says Paul. Now we get to chapter 5. How does Satan ruin a church? How does the devil destroy a congregation? There's two ways. There's two ways. One is false doctrine. We know the congregations that are out there, the denominations, the synods that do not preach the whole word of God. They twist, they manipulate, they pick, they choose. They say, well, this was written to the people of their day, but it's no longer applicable to our day. We recognize the historicity of the context, but times have changed. People have changed. We're no longer like those people back in biblical times. Two thousand years have passed, and so those rules, those laws, those regulations, those admonitions, those guidelines, Guidelines, they are no longer applicable to us today. Not so, says the Word of God. You see, here's the trap 
here's the trap of false doctrine. Here's the trap of denying the scriptures. It seems so loving and so kind and so generous, so welcoming and inviting, but there's a deep, deep pit under that line of thinking. If I can deny this little bitty word of God here, then I can deny this. What's harder to do? For God to cause Jonah to be swallowed up by a whale where he would live on the bottom of the sea for three full days to be spat out in perfect health onto dry land? Or for God to raise his son from the dead? What's harder to do? For Jesus to walk across the stormy seas of the Sea of Galilee to go out to give comfort and rescue to his disciples who are terrified during the storm or for God to reach into the tomb and revive, revitalize and bring alive his son to, to overcome death and the grave and the power of the grave. What's harder to do? For Jesus to take five little loaves of bread and two small fish, basically a package of crackers and a can of sardines, and feed 5,000 people, what's harder to do, that or this? If I fall into the trap, the demonic, satanic trap of denying the word, any part of the word, Ultimately, the danger is to deny this. That's the reason we as Christians, that's the reason we as Lutheran Christians, that's the reason we as Missouri Synod Lutheran Christians cling tenaciously to the whole Word of God. As Jesus says, not one jot or tittle shall be removed, right? Not even a little itty bitty bitty bit. You and I can look through the world today and we can see churches that have rejected the Word of God, they have denied the Word of God, they have corrupted the Word of God, and I quite frankly even hesitate to call them churches. Because a church is a gathering of God's people. A church is a gathering of disciples of Jesus Christ who say, I am committed to you, Lord. And Satan, through cunning and stealth, has ruined those churches. Ruined those churches. That's one way. Another way that the devil can ruin a church is through discord, disunity gossip, rumors, false stories, accusations, hateful words and hateful attitudes. You see how it works? One good loving church member suddenly becomes angry at another good loving church member and now there is no love between them. And that spreads and that grows throughout the congregation and suddenly we start focusing inward. Our, we, it's like we have blinders on. We don't see that there's a lost world out there that is going to hell, a lost world that is damned because they do not confess Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. Suddenly we're worried about little things and small things and insignificant things. And that's exactly what the devil wants. I remember a long time ago I read a story about a man who went to his priest. He goes to his priest for confession. And he goes into the confessional, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been X number of days since my last confession. 
and he tells the priest, you know what, I'm doing pretty good in my Christian walk in life. I'm, I read my Bible, I say my prayers, I try to live a life that is devoted to God, but for some reason, I don't know why, it's part of my makeup, part of who I am. I, I just love to gossip about people. I just love to hear a good juicy story and then run and tell somebody else. Father, I don't enjoy doing this, but in a way I do. It's kind of a charge. It's kind of a, you know, a, a power trip, so to speak. And I really, really want to stop it. I don't know how. And the priest, he tells this man, he said, I tell you what, you go home, you get your pillow, you tear open the end of that pillow. Then with that open pillow, you go to every single house in the village and you take a feather out of that open pillow and you lay it at the doorstep. Do the entire village. When you're done, I want you to come back to me and we're going to talk about it. The guy does. He goes home. He grabs the pillow. He tears it open. He walks throughout the village. He puts a feather at every single doorstep. Feather after feather, door after door, house after house. He's done. He's finished. He goes back to the church. He goes to the priest into the confessional and the priest asks him, did you do what I told you to do? Yes, father. I put a feather at every single door just like you said. And the priest says, now here's what I want you to do. Go pick up every single one of those feathers. The man says, I can't. You know, the wind has blown them away. I have no idea where they might be right now. And the priest tells him, that's the way it is. When you spread a false rumor. That's the way it is when you gossip about somebody. That's the way it is when you don't love your brother or your sister in faith. The words go out and away they go and they cannot be retrieved. You can't take it back, can you? The Apostle Paul, he writes to his young friend in chapter 5, the best way to fight against Satan when he seeks to cause division in the church first is to recognize it recognize it for what it is and then to battle it with love to love one another to treat one another with respect to encourage one another to support one another, to pray for one another, to guide one another. That's the way we battle Satan. When Satan comes to seek to destroy the church, you'll notice what Jesus Christ said in today's gospel lesson. You and I, through our efforts and our energies, we cannot build the church, can we? Jesus Christ says, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. They'll try, but they will not succeed. I've pointed this out before, but I feel compelled to point it out yet again today. Have you ever noticed the doors in our sanctuary, how they open? Every single one of these doors. I even checked yesterday. I was here at church, putting some notes together, and I came in here and, okay, opens out, 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 opens out. Every single door in our church opens outward. And you say, well, yeah, of course, probably the fire marshal made you do that. Well, that might very well be, but it still gives a good message to each and every one of us. The church, its mission, its ministry is to focus outward into the world. And have you ever noticed this as well? Everybody look at the ceiling right now. Whenever you go into a church, most churches, not all, but most churches, the ceiling looks a lot like this. You have beams, you have rafters, you have exposed wood. You know there's a reason behind that? It's not simply to keep the rain off of our heads. The reason so many churches are built like this, imagine, imagine this, that you're looking into the hold of a ship. 
down into the cargo area. That's what this is supposed to represent. That's the picture language that designers of churches are trying to represent when they construct a church like this with all of its exposed beams and bolts and boards. Everything that's up there is supposed to remind us that we are the ship of the saved sailing toward heaven. And if we are the ship of the saved, it is our mission and ministry to reach out into the sea those who are lost, those who are struggling, those who are floundering, to reach out to grab hold of them and to pull them in. And you'll notice this. You can't do that when you're mad. You can't rescue somebody when you're angry. You can't save somebody when you're just cotton-picking mad with that individual. What do we do? We give it to God. God bless and be with me. God grant me your wisdom and your power. God grant me your peace and your patience. In the name of Christ, drive Satan away from me. And help me to live a life that is worthy of you. That, my friends, is how we battle Satan. Friends and fellow Christians, with that I say, Amen. <laughs> now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and our minds in the one true faith which is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.